Listen, listen, listen. This is episode three of Fact Check, the series where I, as a trained psychologist and behavioral scientist, review the psychology and behavioral science advice given by other people on the internet. In episode one, we looked at a video from Joey from Better Ideas. In episode two, we looked at Mr. Matt Diavella. So it seems only fitting that here in episode three, we'll be looking at the OG productivity self-improvement YouTuber himself, Mr. Thomas Frank. Thomas Frank has been uploading self-improvement videos to YouTube for so many years now and has amassed a very impressive following of over 2 million subscribers. So in this episode, we're going to be reviewing one of his older videos actually, which is called How to Actually Break Bad Habits. Now, as I said in episode two, I happen to know quite a bit about the science of habits. I work for Professor Wendy Wood, and as a result of that job, I try to internalize and understand as much of the current scientific understanding around the science of habits as much as possible. So let's see what advice Thomas Frank gives in this video and see if it stands up to the current scientific understanding of habits. I wanna show you guys a picture. This was my fridge in my freshman dorm room, and it looks terrible, I know. For most of college and for a lot of high school, I had a terrible addiction to energy drinks and sodas, monsters, Red Bulls, Nosses, and I knew it was unhealthy for me. So Thomas Frank here in his habits video is talking about an addiction to energy drinks. And so I think it's really worth making the distinction between addiction and habits. A bad habit, just like any habit, is a mental shortcut, which means that as you repeat the behavior more and more, you should be allocating less cognitive resources, i.e. you should be thinking less about the behavior more and more as you repeat it over time. The hallmark of a habit is when people simply repeat behaviors without any deliberation, without really thinking about what they're doing. With addiction, as you repeat the behavior again and again, you don't think about the behavior less, in fact you think about it more and more, until for many people the behavior becomes completely consuming of their lives and all they can think about is how to get that next high. Addiction is much more destructive and serious, so I don't think the term addiction should be used in a bad habit video. And it's important to understand this, every habit has a reward, otherwise you wouldn't do it. So essentially, a bad habit is really any habit that stands in opposition to your long-term goals, be it living a healthy life, or maintaining good relationships, or earning straight A's. And the reason that these bad habits stick around for so long is because they are ingrained, but almost always, they're habits that lead to short-term rewards. And your brain is hardwired to care a lot more about the short-term than your long-term goals, even though logically, you know those long-term goals are more important. This is correct from Thomas Frank. So in behavioral science, we have this concept called temporal discounting, which basically means that we overvalue things in the short term and we undervalue future payoffs, even if those future payoffs are worth more. And in a similar vein, in normal psychology, we have this idea of instant gratification, which basically just says that we really want to satisfy our desires and be rewarded now, rather than wait for those better long-term payoffs. And Thomas Frank is totally correct in saying that a lot of our bad habits come about because of this psychological bias that we have towards short-term payoffs. We don't value those long-term rewards as much as we do the short-term ones, and so we tend to give in to these instant gratification cravings that lead to bad habits. So essentially, you're acting against your own self-interest. And in fact, there's a term that originates in ancient Greece for this called acrasia. And if you wanna be able to beat that acrasia, if you wanna be able to beat that short-term focused programming deep inside your brain, you need to have a clear, well-defined, and compelling reason for breaking that bad habit. You can also create a real physical reminder of why you're trying to break that habit as well. And that's actually what I did. Out of all the reasons I had for stopping my addiction to energy drinks, the main one was my face. Because for most of high school and for a lot of college, I had horrible acne. My complexion was basically the dark side of the moon and it wrecked my self-confidence. And it was bad enough that I would wake up pretty much every day with blood stains on my pillowcase and my sheets. So I really wanted to fix this problem. And I'd spend hours researching online, trying to find remedies and fixes and trying to figure out what the causes were. But eventually I realized what I had basically known all along, which is that sugar, especially sugary energy drinks and soda were a huge cause of breakouts. So one day I decided to crystallize this reason in physical form and I actually went into Photoshop. I took a picture of myself and I used the clone tool to create a Photoshopped version of that picture, basically an idealized version of what I want to look like someday. And then I put that on my phone and every time I would get a craving to go buy a monster or buy a Red Bull, I would look at that picture and I knew if I gave in to that craving, I was pushing that reality further and further into the future. 
So while he's likening this point to a visualization phenomenon, I think what Thomas Frank has actually done and the reason why it worked for him is because what it is is it's a timely prompt for when he's about to engage in the behavior. So in health psychology we know that if you time a prompt just right when the person is undergoing the worst of their temptation, that you can actually curb their behavior in the short term. And the reason why this works is because habits are automatic processes. They occur without much deliberative thought. So if you intervene at just the right time and you get people to slow down a bit and just think, actually, what do I really want to achieve? What are my long-term goals? Just that little bit of slowing down, that little bit of deliberation can lead to people breaking away from their bad habits in that moment and therefore avoiding the bad behavior. So I think that's really what Thomas Frank has done here. It's not to do with the visualization. It's not to do with the fact that he Photoshopped his face. Well, I think that's quite a nice prompt. I think that what actually happened here is that when he was tempted to buy those energy drinks, he would look at that photoshopped photo on his phone and that just slowed him down and made him reconsider his long-term goals and that's why it worked not because it was a visualization but just because it was a very timely prompt now that did help immensely but of course it was still tough to resist those cravings and one additional thing that really helped me to stave them off was actually replacing energy drinks and soda with something different that still gave me a very similar reward and that's actually the second tip here if you can find a different routine that replaces the reward with something similar, then you can replace the habit with something more productive. And this is actually something Charles Duhigg talks about in The Power of Habit. Now for me, I replaced my energy drink addiction and my soda addiction in part with sparkling drinks, LaCroix, Topo Chico, San Pellegrino, because I realized it wasn't necessarily the taste of the drinks that I was addicted to. It wasn't even necessarily the caffeine. It was just the novelty of having that cool can on the desk and having some good tasting drink while I did my boring homework. So I asked myself, is there something else where I can get a similar, if not exact same benefit? And when my girlfriend actually introduced me to LaCroix, which is like a lemon flavored one, I was like, this doesn't taste the same, but it's carbonated, it's in a can, it's got a bit of novelty to it. So it kind of replaced soda in that habit. So I actually wasn't too sure about what to say about this tip. So I consulted Professor Wendy Wood, the world's leading expert on the science of habits. And this is what she had to say about it. Um, so, I'm watching all these habit tip videos given by these non-psychologists online, right? And uh, and some of them will su suggest doing like a replacement habit to replace a bad habit that they had previously. So there's a guy talking about how he was addicted to energy drinks. And he said, well, I, I just replaced my purchasing habit of an energy drink with like lemonade. Um, mm. Is that a good strategy for breaking bad habits, do you think? Yeah, it's, well, it's a strategy that has a label, it's response substitution, um, and it is a strategy you can use. And actually purchasing drinks is a, is a good example of something like that. So it is a strategy that, that people use simply because if the new behavior is almost identical to the old one, then it will be very easy to shift. I mean, in the US, people go to convenience stores and they did pick up a lot of soda, sugared soda, and then we all learned we shouldn't be consuming so much sugar. And so there's been a more of an increase in buying bottled water. Now that has its own problems, right? Because then you have this single use plastic, but apart from that, it's still better for your health than um, buying sugared soda. And so people have been able to shift reasonably quickly from one to another, suggesting that response substitution. But many responses aren't quite that interchangeable. So if it's not really easily interchangeable like that, it's going to be a bit more of a challenge. And you'll have to actually learn the new habit so that it will replace an old one, and that's the more common situation. Another crucial step you need to take when breaking a bad habit is to remove as much access to that habit as you possibly can. In The Odyssey, when Odysseus and his men are sailing past the island of the Sirens, he actually has his men bind him to the ship's mast with ropes and then put beeswax in their own ears. That way, they can't hear the siren song at all, and he can still hear to navigate the ship, but he won't be able to give in to the temptation. 
because Odysseus knew when he was removed from that temptation, he was able to think rationally and logically, and he had enough willpower to set up a pre-commitment, which made it so that when his willpower failed in the face of temptation, he was unable to give into it anyway. So use this tactic when you're trying to break your own bad habits. And I do this as well. I actually have a pretty bad habit of looking at analytics on YouTube or social media sites like Twitter or Facebook when I should be writing. So I actually have a program that completely blocks all access to those sites, basically binding me to doing my writing and making it completely impossible for me to go distract myself. Essentially, if I have no access to that habit, I'm not gonna be able to give into it. This is really the best advice that you can have if you wanna break a bad habit, is you just wanna be removing the cues to that bad habit as much as possible. Using software like here, I think is a really good idea if your bad habit can be solved that way, but you can also think about other problems. For example, if you have a bad habit of playing video games rather than studying, then try study in the library, right? And if you try and study in the library, then it's actually much harder for you to be tempted to play video games. So removing these cues to your bad behaviors, in my opinion, is the best way to overcome your bad habits. But the other idea he talked about too, of Odysseus being tied to the ship, the pre-commitment device, that is such a powerful analogy for one of the best strategies for combating your bad habits. In behavioral science, we sometimes call these hot versus cold states. In a hot state, that means that you're, you're stressed, you're anxious, you're uh, sexually aroused. These are states of mind where we can't actually think very clearly about what we really want long term. And like I said earlier, when you're stressed or you're tired, you're more likely to fall into those bad habits. So one thing that you can do, just like Ulysses did when he tied himself to the mast of the ship, is to basically tie yourself to the good behavior before you're even tempted to engage in the bad one. The classic example that I like to give is that during your lunch break, are you often tempted to spend more money than you need to, or maybe to buy some unhealthy food from the local shop? Would you rather be eating a healthier lunch that you prepared earlier at home? Then you should do that. If you prep your lunches at home the day before or a few days before you go to work, then when you're hungry in the office, you're going to be significantly less tempted to buy those unhealthy foods and spend all that money, and instead you're going to eat that food that you prepared at home earlier when you were in your colder, more rational state. Lastly, if you find the prospect of going completely cold turkey and quitting your bad habit forever daunting, try a 30-day challenge. Anybody, and I mean anybody, can do a 30-day challenge, abstaining from that thing for just 30 days. And the way that I do this is I create a Google Sheet and I give the URL to my friend Martin. Every day I will go in, I will log my progress, and I tell him, check on my progress, and if I fail even once, I'm gonna give you $100. So I don't wanna fail, it'll hurt my pride, it'll hurt my wallet, and I know I've got somebody invested in my success who is gonna keep me accountable. And hey, it's just for 30 days. So again, anybody can do it. You would think that having a financial incentive would improve your ability to adhere to good habits. However, there's some research to suggest that having a financial incentive can actually undermine your intrinsic motivation. So I'd always be a bit cautious about introducing financial incentives into your habit building strategies, because we know that the people who tend to be most successful with living lives with good habits do so because they find that habit intrinsically rewarding. They simply find the behavior rewarding in itself. And if that's true for the behavior that you're trying to build, introducing a financial incentive could be more harmful rather than helpful. So quick recap here. If you wanna break a bad habit, number one, have a compelling, crystallized, well-defined reason in your mind for why you wanna break it and try to create a physical reminder of that reason. Number two, what was number two? <laughs> I don't know what it was. <laughs> number two, identify the reward and try to replace the routine with something that gives you a similar reward. Also remove as much access to that habit as you possibly can. And finally, start out with a simple 30 day challenge instead of trying to go cold turkey permanently. Okay, Thomas Frank, it's time for your score. So like I said, the way that we score these videos is that everybody starts out at 10 out of 10, and then we deduct points for every incorrect thing that they say. So I'm afraid I have to deduct at least one point for you using the term addiction and bad habits interchangeably, not really the same thing. And I have to deduct another point for the crystallization because I think you overemphasized why that intervention worked for you. It wasn't really the crystallization that made it work for you, but instead it was that prompt on your phone, it was that photo being on your phone that you were looking at when you attempted to buy those energy drinks. That was what worked, not the crystallization parts. The reward replacement thing can definitely work for a lot of people if it applies to your bad habit. And certainly the talk about the environmental control is obviously the most powerful way for you to change your habits. But Thomas Frank, I'm gonna give you that extra bonus point because you used that Ulysses Odysseus analogy, which is one of my favorite analogies in all of behavioral science explaining commitment devices to people. So overall, Thomas Frank, you get a whopping nine out of 10, which is pretty darn good. If you guys enjoyed this video, please can you give me a thumbs up because it really helps me out. And if you have any suggestions for other people on the internet that you think should be fact-checked, let me know in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>
bind him to the ship's mast with ropes, and then put beeswax in their own ears. 